That's our intro. What's up, world? Um, podcast number three. We're rocking and rolling. I mean, we're cruising, right, guys? Um, we want to dive off into nutrition today. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we know. We're all three um, nutrition coaches, and we work with the uh, gym pop athletes um, in the nutrition realm. And we want to kind of school you, whether you are a trainer new to the nutrition world or you're some clients, you know, currently with, working with us or maybe some future clients. I don't know. But uh, we want to talk about energy balance, maybe some fads within that, right, Joseph? Love me a good fad. I love me a Joseph's good fad. Favorite <laughs> word. And um, yeah, so let's kick it off. Let's let's start off with energy balance, because I don't think we can really talk about nutrition and energy unless you just talk about what energy balance is right so what uh what makes our energy you know expenditure throughout the day joseph what's the biggest one like the largest one that makes up our energy throughout the yeah, day yeah yeah that one calories <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah yeah calories right calories in calories that's what we believe in calories in calories out and there, there's it, it can't called, stop there it cannot yeah. stop there it's the show must go on there's more to it than yeah, just calories in calories out if it was just calories in calories out we would we would stop the show right now and and move on from it but you know let's talk about what makes up your energy expenditure throughout the day and there's this thing called bmr that joseph's like an expert in it love me fun. a good metabolism talk um <laughs> so bmr stands for basal metabolic rate number one basal means baseline the bare minimum uh, to kind of sustain and keep you alive. And so the way we find out your BMR uh, is a couple of cool different ways. It's your height, your age, your weight, your gender, um, and muscle mass plays a really big role. And muscle mass is something that a lot of people don't take into consideration, right? Which is why Tyler is a is a bodybuilder and just builds muscle all the time. Is yeah. so he can literally speed up his BMR by having more muscle. And so a lot of times we think, you know, we hear it all the time. We're gonna dive into it a little bit later today. Uh, a lot of people say my metabolism's crashed. I got a slow metabolism. Oh, right? that's such a good one, isn't it, Joseph? Yeah, oh, I love it. Where is the reset button on your? Is it on your back? Your reset button? <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the yes. metabolism reset button. It's on the back where you wind yourself up in the morning. Unplug it and plug it back unplug in again. Unplug it. No way. Well, I've tried you, unplugging it and plugging it back in. You got to remember, if you unplug it, you got to wait at least ten seconds. Let the body reset. Plug it back in. The All lights, right. will, the lights will blink and it'll tell you. <laughs> right now, right everyone in tech support is like, "Oh man, <laughs> these man, guys figured it out." Uh, so you cannot reset your metabolism. Okay, I don't care how many pills, powders, and places you press on your body. Pills, never- powders, and places. Clip it. <laughs> Clip it, stamp it, pills, powders, and places. You can't do it. Uh, we see it all the time. It's a catchphrase, right? It, it causes people to want to spend money. It sounds good. Um, and, and you can't reset it. It's literally exactly what I said earlier. Your height, your age, your weight, your gender, and muscle mass. You can't reset that unless you literally die. Come back to life, I guess. Be, you know? A, a defibrillator. A defibrillator. <laughs> <laughs> we have reset your metabolism. That's not going to happen, guys. And so that's what your metabolism is. It, it's the amount of calories it takes you at your height, your age, your weight, your gender, and your muscle mass to stay alive while laying in bed or laying down in a dark zero sensory room, but you have to actually be awake. You cannot be asleep. And so it's how many calories it takes you to stay alive um, without sleeping. And then we we hear another term called RMR, resting metabolic rate. It's a little bit higher than your BMR. And that kind of gets into like your daily activities and stuff like that. It's not your metabolism that's crashed. It's not your metabolism that's slow. That's pretty constant actually as you go. Fun fact, as you lose weight, your metabolism slows down. A lot of people don't understand that concept. We have, if you don't believe me, let's say you wanted to lose 50 pounds, put a backpack on with 50 pounds in it and go live life and watch how tired you will become. Look how sweaty you will be. Look how sore you will be. And so if you did the opposite, if you took away 50 pounds, your body can function easier, right? Um, And so as we lose weight, 
our metabolism slows down. We try to combat that by doing some weight loss with building muscle. So hopefully if you have a weight loss journey, you are trying to hit the gym and trying to build muscle as well. There's a couple other cool things that uh, Tyler and Cody are going to dive. I'm going to kick it to Cody. Woo. Um, and he's going to talk about something very neat. That's, that, was, that was a neat transition. Uh, Joseph, I like that. You're a pretty neat guy. <laughs> um, Neat is, I think, probably one of my favorite, that's how you know we're nerds, is that we have favorite components of, like, metabolism. It's fine. Whatever. Whatever. Um, it's probably one of my favorite parts of our, quote, unquote, metabolism. So, Joseph talked about uh, BMR. I'll chat about Neat. Tyler's going to talk about thermic effective food and thermic effective exercise. Um, but going back to NEAT, the, the way to think about NEAT, and it stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. I know that's, that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it's again for the people in the back. The best way to think about NEAT uh, is this is the energy expenditure that's associated with talking with your hands, being expressive, parking your car further away from the grocery store and walking in all of your like non-exercise steps throughout the day, maintaining posture, whether you're seated or standing at work, all of those things comprise NEAT. One of the really cool things about it though is that it's highly variable and so it, it can fluctuate day to day. And then the other thing uh, that's really interesting is um, it can be pretty variable person to person. So some people can have a pretty low quote unquote NEAT while others might have a really high need. So, you know, to put this into terms that we're all familiar with, this would be like somebody who uh, works from home and works completely remote from their computer and they live in a very small apartment. Their need is likely going to be very, very, very small, right? They get up, they go to the bathroom, they cook their food in their, their apartment, and then they sit at a desk for like eight to 10 hours, right? So they're not moving around. They're not super active throughout the day. Conversely, somebody with generally like high need this could be manual laborers. So think like garbage man, roofers, people who are a, a rancher, people who are on their feet, moving around, moving, um, you know, heavy things at work that creates a lot of energy expenditure. And so with those individuals, you'll see their neat component be absolutely huge, right? If you are on a weight loss journey, if you are on a health journey, if you're on a, I want to look better and feel better and just kind of move better, that neat component, the, the things that you will do to increase that are awesome. And so we have a lot of control over that component of the metabolism. So spend a lot of your time focusing there. That would probably be one of my suggestions. Yeah. Tyler, so over to you. Yeah. Tell us I, a little I, bit about the thermic effect of food ooh. and exercise. Cody's, Cody's well, Tyler, you, you drew something. Buddy. I did. I, 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 I'm a very visual learner, guys. <laughs> Welcome to the School of Nutrition. So this yeah. is like daily energy expenditure, right? Well, this larger one, BMR, what Joseph already talked about, basal metabolic rate, that's calories you burn just for being alive. You're going to have your knee in there, what Cody just talked about. And you can increase that just based on regular activity level, right? I'm going to talk about TEF, thermic effect of feeding or food, and then TEA, thermic effect of activity. So everyone likes to really focus on these two, or really the top one we'll talk about in a second, but thermic effect of feeding, my favorite one, you burn calories while you eat, right, Joseph? I mean, who doesn't oh, cool. to burn calories while you're feeding? So one thing that's kind of interesting and kind of cool about thermic effect of, of feeding is we actually ex expend more energy based on whether it's a protein within our meal, a carbohydrate within our meal, or a fat within our meal, right boys? So if you look at the percentage of that, it's roughly 20, 25% energy expenditure through protein that we consume, uh, 10 to 15% through carbohydrates, and then somewhere like five, 10-ish percent of fats. So what does that mean? That means that us three in our coaching probably like to make sure that our protein requirements are met for our people. Uh, just because one, it's going to keep you fuller longer. It's going to keep those mind, that mindless snacking down and you're going to burn more calories every time you eat protein. So the good thing is, is you can eat breakfast, you can eat lunch and you can eat dinner and you have a certain amount of protein in there. You're going to be fuller for longer and you're going to burn more calories from within that meal in itself, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's something that a lot of you know people don't think about is the energy expenditure through eating. And that's a big part of our day. It's very important. Um, and if you're not eating and you're starving yourself, We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, what energy expenditure is or is not happening when we're not eating enough. 
Real uh, quick, Tyler. Uh, so thermic effect of feeding. Well, yeah. well, my my trainer, bro, uh, told me I gotta eat every forty five seconds mm. or I'm gonna go catabolic. Is that what you're talking about? That was talking? that was the thing. Like it goes in like trends, right? And I feel like in the two thousands, what would that be around like two thousand five ish? Maybe let's just call it two thousand. Like the thing was to like stoke the fire of metabolism, right? I'm guilty of it. If you can look back at what we knew back in the day, what we what we read about and learned about, I actually taught that for a little while. But guys, it's not a thing. Like you thinking your metabolism is this thing that you're going to constantly add sticks to all day and keep your metabolism up. Your metabolism is your metabolism. We all believe, us three right here, probably believe in three meals a day with some snacks in there, portioned out. And it's not this a certain amount. I think the pendulum swung from six meals a day, seven meals a day. It has and now intermittent swung, fasting. <laughs> it's one meal a not day. Not intermittent fast. It's it has swung to this thing called one meal a day. And it's like I'm not even what one meal a day. I will jump through this screen and eat your face if you only feed me one time a day. Like there's no way. I could do that. That's crazy. So the pendulum has swung. And as always, us three land right in the middle of a solid three meals a day, right? But what we're trying to drive home is TEF, TEF, it's a thing, right? You got to make sure you're eating right and you're eating within proportions, balanced proportions, because you're going to burn calories while you're eating. Then there's this thing called T, thermic effective activity, right? That's the thing people concentrate on the most. Would y'all say that, guys? Yeah. We concentrate on this. 30 minutes to one hour a day where we're a hamster constantly trying to burn as many calories as possible. Well, no matter how hard you do or do not work, I think you're going to be within two or 300 calories of what you think you're burning. And we'll talk about another episode about these handy dandy fitness tractors. Let's just say for this episode, they don't work and they're trash. <laughs> I take mine off when I work out. That's how much I believe in it. So I didn't say that. So Google or uh, Apple or Samsung, if you want to sponsor me and say yeah. you watch this, I sure. said that. Not me. You, know, you know what fitness trackers are really good at measuring what like, distance you ran and your heart rate. That's about it. And, and the time. They're pretty good at telling time. <laughs> the time. Yeah, my time's correct. So we're good. But yeah, we, we focus on, again, this little chart, this TEA, right? Thermic effective activity as the end all be all for our progress. And it's a very, very small part of our day that is kind of, I don't want to say it's out of your control. You can control it. But if that's all you focus on for your goals, it's going to be very hard to get to your goals, right? So now I, I kind of want to kick it to you guys about maybe some fads. We kind of touched on them. Some things we've heard over the course of time, we already talked about the six meals a day, but we hear this a lot, especially in our nutrition programs with our clients is this thing called starvation mode, right? We get it all the time. Hey, Tyler, am I, I'm in starvation mode. You know, I'm not, my body's holding on to everything that I eat. And I'm just, I keep gaining weight because I'm, I'm a polar bear or, or a brown bear going into hibernation and I'm in starvation. But I'm like, time out. Let's just talk about that for a second. Like, Joseph, what, what do you think about starvation mode in your, like, give it to us, the, the biology behind it. Not just, not just your thoughts, but like, I want to <laughs> know, I want to know some things about it, some biology. Yeah. So what I try to tell my clients is, is our bodies are actually set up to be fat. Uh, it's like a survival mechanism. Our, our bodies are really good at, at storing things. It's, it's, we have more storage hormones than we do burning hormones, right? And so when you go on a weight loss journey, we always know that there's that sticking point where it's like, man, I'm doing everything right. Why aren't I losing weight? Yada, yada, yada. And as a, if I'm a good coach, I will say, hey, stay the course. Don't give up on me. Let's not change a thing. You're going to be okay. And a lot of people have it. That's a tough relationship. So I will admit that it's a very tough relationship to, to do everything in your power and not see the progress or the results that you think you should. And sometimes the body does complicate things. But when we throw out or when a trainer throws out to their clients, oh, you're, you're in starvation mode. That's why you crashed your metabolism. We've got to reset your metabolism. You're not eating enough calories. That's not true. Take any moment in history where there was a famine or where we starved a certain population and they died realistically from starvation. They didn't die fat. <laughs> I will tell you that. They died no. skin and bones. 
right? Um, and so a lot of times, uh, you know, when we talk about starvation mode, what ends up happening is we do, we might follow a really extreme diet Monday through Friday, and then we end, ju- end up binging over the weekend. And, and we think that it, it shouldn't account because we had five good days, but these two bad days over here, or maybe like two and a half bad days, because Friday night's kind of iffy, um, gained all of those calories back. And so if we were in a 3000 calorie deficit Monday through Friday, it's very easy to over consume 3000 calories over the weekend. We start talking about sauces, seasonings, alcohol, juices, you know, your liquid beverages, stuff like that. Um, very easy. And so when someone says, oh, my metabolism's crashed, I can't see any progress. It, it's probably because of that. It's probably because we're on a starvation diet, an extreme diet Monday through Friday, and then we overcompensate um, some other way. And so, but there is something science, you know, like Cody talked about here in a little bit um, called metabolic adaptation. And metabolic adaptation is all of those other things that we talked about, neat thermic effective activity and stuff like that. Those things slow down, right? Your body is saying, hey, you're not feeding me enough food. So I'm going to stop talking with my hands. And it happens unconsciously. It happens, we, we don't have a say in it. And so, you know, I was talking to my clients and said, hey, tell me about how lazy you've been lately. Oh my goodness, been so lazy. Like the other day, I didn't even get the remote. I made my husband go get the remote. That was some neat that you could have taken advantage of and you didn't. And so it's little things like that that happen. Um, and, and so this metabolic adaptation kind of concept is, it's not our metabolism crashing. We're not in starvation mode. Your body is just really good at slowing you down. Cody, what do you got to say about it? I want to say one thing r- real quick, Cody. And it's, I, I had a conversation with a client the other day and it was, it was about this, about we we've read these research studies recently where um, it's talk of, talks about your actual metabolism and research is showing that your actual metabolism is not slowing down to about 65, you know? So we always think, oh, I'm older. My metabolism is slowing down. It's not like, I, I hate to break that to you and be the bearer of bad news audience. Your metabolism is not slowing down. What is slowing down is your life. Okay. Let's, let's just think about this. Okay. I'm 35. Now, if I think about my life when I was 22, 23 outside of sports, okay outside of the sports I played, what I did all day. I was, I was walking to classes. I was, I was walking to where I ate every day. I was going out and having fun with friends. I was playing a sport. I was doing all these things. My activity level was way higher than it was now. Now I'm either sitting with clients, I'm sitting on the computer. My overall activity level is drastically different from when I was 22, 25, 27 years old. And I think that happens with everybody. We confuse being busy with active. Just because you're a busy parent and you're 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 driving to go get your kids and driving here and driving to appointments and driving and doing these things, you're busy, you're not active. And I think that's something that we as a society have really lost track of is we're just blaming it on being older than our metabolism when it's really not because it's not slowing down to where roughly 65. So I just wanted to get that in there before Cody goes off on adaptations. To caveat that though, so we slow down as we get older, but we also tend to make a little bit more money, hopefully. So we're drinking a little bit more, we're eating a little bit better, right? So it's like we're going in two opposite directions and both are negative. We're slowing down and we're eating more because as we get older, we actually get more social. Um, And those social gatherings revolve around a dinner table most of the time or a bar, you know? Um, and so again, two totally other things. Okay, Cody, your turn. Sorry to cut you off, but don't forget. <laughs> what I just like hearing you speak, man. I just like it. I, I think to speak about these metabolic adaptations, one of the most important things um, that we probably, that, that I want listeners to like be able to wrap their head around is a lot of these changes are like very predictable. Um, and they don't just like happen out of the blue. And, and like Joseph and Tyler have talked about, like a metabolism crashing is if that were to actually be true, like that would imply that, that, um, things are completely out of our control and like, oh my gosh, you know, like we're on this like roller coaster to, to doomsday. Right. Um, but these adaptations that we're about to talk about, like, we know that they're going to happen and they're pretty measurable and they're very predictable. And, and so for us coaches like this, this is where it it becomes important for us to be able to communicate these things in a way that um, people can understand and, and that our clients can actually uh, wrap their heads around so that they also understand kind of what's happening. One of the biggest ones, basal metabolic rate, 
Um, hopefully, we don't see a whole lot of change happening to BMR. And the reason why is because if, if we're losing body fat, right, we're, we're resistance training. And this is where the value of resistance training comes in is in that calorie deficit, in that energy deficit. We want to lose body fat, but maintain lean body mass. And again, like that lean body mass amount, that's very closely correlated with our BMR, right? So if, if we're successful with dieting, if we're successful with, with fat loss, then hopefully our BMR doesn't change too terribly much. With that said, though, a smaller body in general would just requires less energy, right? So if you make drastic weight loss um, from, you know, let's just throw out crazy numbers, 400 down to 200 pounds, undoubtedly, you will likely see a, a drop in BMR just because it's a smaller body, right? Um, but that's, again, where the, the benefits of resistance training come in is you can maintain or improve how much muscle mass, lean body mass you have, and that uh, will help bolster your, your basal metabolic rate. So that's good. When we are successfully in a calorie deficit, this implies that we are eating fewer calories and therefore fewer protein, carbs, and fats, right? And so with that in mind, Tyler mentioned the percentages. We can just generally on average say that like your total thermic effect of food or feeding is going to be 10, 12-ish percent, right? When you take the averages of protein, carbs, and fats. And so to put some numbers to it for listeners, you know, if you go from eating 2,000 calories and we have, let's say, 10% thermic effect of food, that's 200 calories, right? And if, if just to be dramatic, if we eat a thousand calories, our thermic effect of food is still 10%, but now it's only a hundred calories, right? Almost nobody take this and go eat a thousand calories. Do you Correct. not do that. <laughs> we know you're thinking, we know you're thinking that. about it. Cody Don't do it. Said, nope. Cody said eat a thousand calories. Oh, here we go. Food. Common section that blow up. These guys have no idea what they're no. doing. This is that what 2000 to 1000 is simply for ease of math, right? Because if we start throwing out, yeah, if we start throwing out complex numbers and whatnot, we're going to lose every calculator. I need a calculator. Uh -uh. So with that example, which that's all it was, uh, you can clearly see that the thermic effect of food, one component of our metabolism is going to shrink, right? And so this is one of the adaptations to our metabolism that's really predictable, right? Other things that we might see in extended periods of energy deficits and calorie deficits, that meat component will subconsciously shift downwards. Our body is, is smart. Like Joseph mentioned, like from a from an evolutionary standpoint, like we want to maintain equilibrium, right? So um, our body will subconsciously, you know, I'm putting this in air quotes, we'll get a little bit lazier for lack of a better term. Like we won't be as prone to talk as much or be ex as expressive with our hands or with our face, we will want to stand less at our standing desk or on our treadmill desk, and we will be more prone and more comfortable being seated. Um, so those are all things as a part of the neat component that we will see people just just subconsciously downregulate. Now, the cool thing though, is that this is it within our control. And so to offset that, we can do some things like increase the number of steps per day, or at least maintain. You can add in quote unquote cardio or other like conditioning or aerobic activities, whatnot. Um, there's, I've even seen some really cool folks do some things that actually, Joseph, you mentioned, they, I don't know the right way to say this. They put on exogenous weight in a compensatory fashion. And so what I mean by that is if you lose 10 pounds, yeah. great. You're carrying a 10 pound backpack around with you all the time or a 10 pound weighted vest. I've seen a handful of people, generally competitors, be really successful with that. Now I'm not saying general population people should walk around with a weight vest and ankle <laughs> weights to offset. Oh, like I'm don't, don't I'm not don't, saying that. Think no. back to the nineties, man, my mom crushed the ankle weights, bro. She would not leave the bedroom <laughs> right. without ankle weights on. And I tell you what, she lived uh, like, with a sweaty ankles all day long. Truly, <laughs> truly <laughs> ahead of her time, Joseph. Truly ahead of her time. They Lord had it years. figured out in the nineties. And here we are in 2020 still. Yeah, like, well, I think, I think one thing about meta metabolic adaptation is now, like, I think that leads us into talking about plateaus and, and how you break through them, right? Because we often either, we get a client that's either in a plateau before they've come to see us maybe they a perceived plateau, or we have a client that's been with us for a little while and they hit a plateau. 
I tell every client that ever starts working with me, my online clients, I'm like, you're going to hit a plateau. It's almost inevitable. I will see you at train station plateau with a bag saying, told you told so. Told you so. <laughs> because, it, because it's coming. And they're like, I don't know. And then yet yeah, they still get frustrated. And I get it. We don't like plateaus. It's a, it's a stalling of progress, right? And what a lot of people think a plateau is, is a week of stalled progress. Not really. It's roughly two plus weeks of stalled progress, kind of touching on a third week of what the true definition of a plateau is, right? So I want to talk about, talk about how you maybe get through a plateau, Joseph, um, nutrition wise in a second. I want to talk about it from like a workout standpoint. Okay. Well, Tyler, ways. hang on one second. I'm going to interrupt yeah. you. No, please. You've only covered three components of the metabolism and adaptations. We have the fourth. Oh, you gotta talk about, you've got to talk about activity. We've got to talk about it because it's probably I, one of I, I, I erased it. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we just got off into a rabbit hole. So Let's talk about you got off in a rabbit. I did. Cody was <laughs> going. <laughs> I'm over here just a Jack Russell Terrier chasing chasing rabbits, boys. So let's talk about TEA, thermic effect activity, and then that let's let that lead into plateaus because they kind of perfect grow. segue. It's the perfect. It's like it was meant to be. Right. So thermic effect of activity is just simply how many calories we burn for working out. Right. We mentioned the calorie trackers; they're terrible. I take mine off. Let's just say it burns 400. All right. If it's 200, cool. If it's 600, cool. Let's just average it at four. Right. And so, I mean, I, I don't know really how y'all coach y'all's online people, but I don't take into effect. TEA, hardly at all, unless they're doing marathons, CrossFit competitions, something that it, we know is burning a, a substantial amount of calories. But if they're doing some sort of fitness class, hitting the gym for an hour, we most, all three of us, average it out and put that within the plan of, of coaching and nutrition and all that. So to, to talk about thermic effective activity, guys, it makes up a very small portion of our day of overall calories burned. If we want to talk about how we increase that based on a plateau, right? So if I get someone that comes to me and they're in a plateau, I first just, hey, how you been? How you sleeping? How you, how, right? How's life, right? What's your water intake? What's your measurements? I want to know all these things because if we try and paint a picture with one brushstroke, it's a very, it's a very boring picture, right? But the more data I can get on those things I just mentioned, we're making a lot of brushstrokes, which a lot with a lot of different colors. And that gives me a better picture of what's actually happening. So then I say, okay, if it looks like, and I say, okay, we're in a plateau based on everything you're telling me, I'm taking that to heart. It's true. <laughs> A lot of our, a lot of our clients like to tell us things and leave out some things. Um, but let's just say you actually are right, Cody. Not mine, um, not mine. Mine are one. No, Joseph's, <laughs> Joseph's clients tell me all the truth. So then I say, okay, like, are we resistance training? No, we've got to start doing some resistance training. Like we have to start doing, I, I don't need you to go be a bodybuilder, but you got to pick up something like you have to. Okay. So if we're not resistance training, let's start resistance training. If we're not doing any activity, let's start doing some activity. Now let's swing the pendulum over and say, hey, we're doing some sort of fitness class every day. I'm going to the gym every day. Well, now I ask, are you progressively overloading or are you just going to the gym and going through the motions? That's important, all right? You're going through the motions. We got to increase our intensity. We have to, all right? Are you a runner and you're running a steady state cardio every single day? end on end like a hamster on a wheel and it's just spinning at the same rate well you're going to get better at running that rate right if i were to go run 10 miles right now it'd be hard if i ran two miles in two weeks it's easier if i run it another two weeks it's easier so steady state cardio and going through the motions in the gym starts to be a plateau within itself so how do we possibly add on maybe a little bit of lean muscle mass within our resistance training program. Like, can we add on? I mean, if you take a pound of muscle and a pound of fat, the muscle is going to burn roughly 2.5, 2.7 times the amount of calories that the fat is, correct? So if we can add on a little bit of lean muscle mass through one month, two months, three months, well, now we are going to be like Cody said, slightly increasing BMR at rest in a fantastic way. Um, so then if you take it at rest, it's increased. Well, then at activity, I don't think we talk about, <laughs> would you call it BMR at activity? That would just be called activity throughout the day. But for me, right, that would just be your knee and your thermic effective activity throughout the day. But just having more muscle on your body and moving it throughout the day is now going to increase more calories. So I asked those things. It's like, okay, if you're going for a run, are you running faster? If you're lifting weights, 
Are you progressively overloading through reps, weight, strength, all those things? And so breaking through the plateau there is how I would do it through activity. And that just takes time, right? We, we've got to live in that maybe plateau. Guys, it's okay to live on a plateau. Live there for two weeks. Let your body settle in. If you've lost 30, 40 pounds, you're going to hit it and you're going to stay there for a little while. Progression down through any program, whether it's weight gain, weight loss, overall health, is going to have a stagnant process. It's a stair step down. And you're going to live at a step for a little while until you can figure out what your activity level is. And that's where us as coaches and hopefully your coach, coach can address that of what you're actually doing. Are you changing your program at all through weights? And, and um, I want to say through effort, right? Like sometimes, RPE. Like, yeah, RPE, like rate of perceived exertion. Are you getting after it or are you just after it? But th that's kind of my, my take on activity and breaking through that. Like Joseph works way more in the nutrition realm of plateaus. Like what would you do, Joseph? If I came to you, I'm your person and I've been there stuck two and a half, three weeks and I'm truly following things to a T and I've, I've, kind of done some things as far as activity like what would you do for me easy give you a fat burner cody next subject <laughs> <laughs> okay <Take> this. No. <laughs> we sell this oh no oh no go to my website use affiliate code no, joseph, no. joseph 20 <laughs> sell 20 percent off buy one get one free i'll send you a free koozie with your fat burner Done. Oh by tomorrow. Oh, there it is. Oh, I was, I was hoping that secret, one. That's the secret sauce. Oh uh, my gosh. Goodness. So, um, real quick, that was a joke, everybody. <clears throat> Cody, did you want to say something about exercise before we get into nutrition again? I, I was just gonna like expand a little bit on what Tyler was saying. I mean, when, when it comes to fat loss, a lot of folks they'll they'll think, okay, well, I'm I'm losing. My goal is fat loss. I, my nutrition's dialed in. Should I like change my rep ranges? Um, and you know, like, oh, I've, I've been putting on bulk with lower rep ranges. And now that I'm trying to lose fat, like now I need to go uh, to high. Now high you want to, you want a tone, right? Cody? You want you a tone. tone. You want Long a tone? muscles. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure like all of us have had clients that have, you know, like alluded to that or asked about it. And generally like my answer is your, the goal during fat loss is to maintain or continue to improve performance and, and progress during your workouts. And so that's where like tracking workouts and working with a coach or like working with somebody third person to you unrelated, like that can be hugely valuable because making those small incremental changes, like Tyler mentioned, progressive overload, there's so much magic in that because when you get to that goal weight or to whatever your goals are, like you're going to be carrying what, around a good amount of lean body mass. You're going to be moving well. You're going to feel pretty good. Try to maintain progress. Try to continue progressing if you can, right? If that makes sense. But get pretty objective and and focus on the numbers. Like track your workouts and and are you adding weight or reps week on week? Try to maintain that progress or performance as best as you can, and and you'll see amazing results by doing that. Um, and I want to I want to say from an exercise standpoint, like and a nerd because we're going to have trainers who are like, well, what about this? I think we all can also conclude that there is something called a genetic ceiling. Okay. However, you've probably never gotten close. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out. There. You are in the basement, actually. Yeah. Of your genetic potential. <laughs> um, and so the genetic ceiling is, hey, you know, our, our bodies by design are, you know, predestined to reach a certain limit, right? Like, you know, it's so funny. I, I forget who I, who I was watching the other day, but they said, hey, I'm never going to dunk a basketball. I don't care how hard I train. I don't care what I do. I'm just never going to dunk a basketball. My genetic ceiling doesn't allow that, right? And so a couple of cool things about training adaptations and how we can progressive overload if we feel like maybe we are reaching our max potential of maybe bench or squat, just do a different variant. Instead of doing barbell bench, go do dumbbell bench. Instead of doing dumbbell bench, go do a machine press. Instead of doing squats, do goblets. Instead of doing goblets, do some, right, something else. And so there's, if you have a, a high quality coach, I'll say, or trainer, 
um, they should recognize that, right? Like, hey, we've been really pushing it. You've been struggling on your last couple of reps for whatever rep range I've got you at. And, and you know what? We haven't made much progress. You know what? Okay, it's probably time for me to change the exercise or similar muscle groups, similar movement patterns, um, and, and just change up the, the kind of workload that we're doing based off of going from a barbell to dumbbells or dumbbells to a machine and stuff like that. And, and again, I, I love people who are like, oh, I've just reached my genetic ceiling. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I mean, you would take, it would take year. I think people underestimate how hard it is to put on muscle. I mean, it takes years and years and years and years to put on, you know, real muscle over an extended, over an extended period of time. Like when I played soccer, I played at like 170 and now I'm like 210 and people are like, dude, what happened to you? And I'm like, dude, that was 10 years ago. Let's dude, take 40 so pounds. Happened. Let's take 40 pounds and divide it by 10. I gained so four pounds. Like, it's very doable, but it takes a long time. Today is... June 14th, not sure when you guys are going to watch this. Um, check my Facebook status on June 15th. That'll be tomorrow. My Facebook post is going to be when a client comes to you and says, I've been gaining weight and your response is, it's because you're building muscle. I, like you didn't gain five pounds in a week of muscle. Chill out. I, w- I, would, I would die for five pounds of muscle in a week. What's the standard? What's the standard within a, a month? Both of y'all, but standard of muscle mass, like you're hitting a resistance. Co- yeah. So two, two cohorts. Well, well, two cohorts, right? Beginner and, you know, regular worker. Right, 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 right. A right. little bit faster in the beginning. I would say like two to four pounds a month, a month. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As, as you progress one to two pounds a month, as you've been like, Hey, I've been doing this for eight, 10, 12 months longer. Um, one to two pounds of muscle mass. How frustrating is it, y'all, when you get a new client, whether it's a female or a male, and their workout age is not very, very long, and they just start putting on, they just start putting on muscle. Your month like six with them, and they're up like you know ten pounds, looking good. And you're like, I would kill to be able to do that because we've been so consistent for so long with with our journey as trainers and coaches and strength training and all that like I have to scratch and claw for every single pound I put on right now just because it's what we do and then you get that client that guy who's like hey man will we train me I'm like yeah for sure and he's sitting there just adding on weight to the to the dumbbells or bench press or squat rack or whatever it is you're like god I would kill to be doing like the progress you're making right now I think it's 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 just funny to me when I think about that with new clients well, uh, Tyler, all you got to do is just don't lift for six months and then mm. go back to the gym. And reg- yeah. <laughs> six month regression, then a six month progression after that. I but think I- with lean body mass, I think the way that I would look at it for people um, is in your first year of training. And again, there's, there's a huge like, thanks mom and dad component to this, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like the range would probably be the first year of, and, and this is assuming intelligent training, right? This is like training that is optimizing your results. This is recovery that's optimizing your results and nutrition that's optimizing your results. And consistency. And consistency, and like in a, in a, in a really quote unquote, optimal situation. I think most people could put on in their first year of training, 15, 20, maybe 25 pounds. The second year that like gets cut in half. So you're looking it's at like so eight, eight to 14 pounds. And then it just like each year after that, like it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Here's the cool part though. Just two years of training. If you're on like the, you know, the lower end, you're like a, a genetic non-responder really to training. You still put on like 10 to 12 pounds in two years. That is awesome. That's great. And that will totally transform how you look, how you feel and how you move, right? I've worked with clients who like, they just, they were doing the things and like, they just weren't really getting a whole lot of the, of the juice for the squeeze, but literally no one has been worse off after smart, intelligent training. And so regardless of what your goals are, like train hard, do the best that you can. And undoubtedly you'll be in a better spot two, three, four years down the road. I've never heard someone say, man, I wish I wasn't so strong. <laughs> like I've never, I've never heard that. I've never said that. It's just wild to me when you get life, life sucks. I got to carry in all the groceries in one trip. I really got to open my <laughs> wife's <laughs> peanut butter jar again because she can't open it. <laughs> Joseph, real quick, super paintbrush. Like how would you change, like get through some sort of plateau in like a, a nutrition sense? 
for our yeah, listeners. Yeah, going back to the fat burners. Act. Well, there's also um, CLA is a hot topic for whatever dude, reason. Stop. Dude, <laughs> dude, been around Food. for decades. Tyler, <laughs> can we kick him off? <laughs> He's gone. Get him off. I here. just want to say, if you haven't watched episode one, we warned you that I was going to be a goofball, <laughs> Cody was going to be nerdy, and Tyler was going to have to wrangle us together. Um, so a couple cool things we can do nutritionally and push through a plateau and not change up kind of the day-to-day calories or the caloric range that you're in um one is macros i love preaching macros and hey let me let me adjust your protein content a little bit let me adjust your cap your carbs a little bit and your fats a little bit because we can manipulate your thermic effect of food by changing up your macros that's super awesome Number two is if I get you on a better macro split for whatever reason, could I also increase your thermic effect of activity because you feel better, right? Could I give you more carbs to give you more energy to go work out? Phenomenal, you know, thing right now where carbs are the devil. Hey, you want to feel better during your workout? Eat some carbs before you go work out. You feel amazing, right? You're going to burn more carbs or you're going to burn more energy during that workout. So we could push through it that way. And then last but not least, I would say, and I've, and I've done it maybe twice in the last 10 years is an actual real refeed. Okay. <clears throat> so what that means is let's say you're you know on a 2000 calorie diet and, and you've changed your macros and tried all these things and we're still kind of at a plateau. We're not seeing progress. A true refeed is a 24 hour period where we're trying to hit two and a half to three times your caloric intake. So that would be somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 calories in this 2,000 calorie example. Just go eat a pizza. Just go eat a pizza. And, and it's, and it's from dirty good. food. It's from dirty. Yeah. I've like read all the re- It's like, hey, just go eat abnormally. Oh, You've been following quick, a strict plan. 10 seconds. What would your <laughs> refeed be right now? Oh, I've already done it before. Hit 10,000 calories one day. It was a dozen Dunkin' Donuts with a milkshake. <laughs> 5 a.m. Okay, Duncan, sponsor me. Um, oh my God. And then uh, after that, it was two bowls of cereal and uh, it was Reese's peanut butter puffs or whatever they're called, Reese's puffs. Um, two bowls of cereal with Mootopia, shameless plug for H-E-B Mootopia, nope. Um, and then lunch, <laughs> lunch, I'm getting, God, we're getting sponsored. Stop I said it. 10 seconds, bro. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Mine would be simple. All right, and- Guys, we're not saying go do this. We're just saying if your nutrition coach, registered dietitian recommends this, do this. We are not saying do this. We're saying in the instance that we did it, this is what we did. All right. Y'all don't need to refeed because y'all refeed every single weekend, Friday through Sunday. Okay. Let's just be real. Come on. Um, I would have French toast and a pizza. That's what I have. French toast breakfast, giant 16 inch pizza for dinner. That's my go-to. Cody, what's yours? I'm going to crush some cereal with some coffee cake. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go ham on some sushi at lunch. Mm, I'll and join then, I will join you for sushi. Yeah, for sure. Sushi. And then I'm, I'm going double wrapped, loaded up Chipotle. Like give mm-hmm. me, give me a burrito that looks like a newborn baby wrapped in tea. The guy I have every time I make mine because it's absurd. Like he has a hard time wrapping it. They got it. They're like, hey, <laughs> they bring over the special roller to go. <laughs> yeah. It happens every single time, and I'm like, let's watch this. And mm-hmm. then when they do it, I'm so impressed by it. But I know exactly what you're talking about. And but here, awesome. to make this valuable, though, we should probably just touch briefly on why these refeeds, or I'll even I'll, I'll use like a like a a diet break, if you will, or like a week yeah. at quote unquote maintenance, like why can that be beneficial? Why is, why does that ultimately help like move the needle? It's also called genuinely for that, a buzzword term carb cycling, right? We, we hear, we hear carb cycling refeeds. We hear all that stuff. And I just mentioned like most people are refeeding over the weekend, so they don't need to do this. And most people are carb cycling over the weekend, but Cody, like you said, what's the actual like science behind that? Like what, what is that doing? I think there's a couple things at play. I think one thing is mentally, like we don't talk like physiologically, we're talking about what's happening, but like mentally, you know, there's this, you get a little reprieve, right? Um, And so you're, I think how that feeds into progress is you get a break, you get a reprieve. What is that? What what does reprieve mean? I don't know. Reprieve? (laughs) Reprieve. (laughs) Reprieve. You get a like break. a break, like a like you can take a rest and. <laughs> I was asking for a friend. I was asking for a friend. <laughs> for, a friend. <laughs> for your dog next to you. <laughs> um, 
but ultimately I think those breaks help with long-term adherence. I think it helps with enjoyment of the process, but then also when, and y'all have alluded to it, when you're just a little bit better fed, that component, that non-exercise activity thermogenesis will potentially like upregulate a little bit. So you're more likely to move around. You're more likely to work out harder. You're consuming more calories. So your thermic effect of food is increased. So now like hopefully listeners are, are starting to see how all of these things are connected and how one can influence the other based off of, you know, our macronutrient ratios, our macronutrients, um, quality of our food and, and talking about carb cycling, like you even start getting into like meal timing and frequency and whatnot and some of the benefits those can have for, for some individuals. Um, but that's, I see where a lot of the value is in a, a refeed, a quote unquote cheat day. I'm not a fan of that word or a diet break, if you will. I like to call them diet breaks. Yeah. I mean, nail on the head there. There's, there's, you know, if you, we, we're way out of time, but there's certain, you know, hormone levels that, that get kind of fluctuated when we've been in deficit for a little while and then we refeed it. And, you know, I think just your hunger levels and your uh, fullness will, will change as well. But all those things are that we mentioned breaking through plateaus, being consistent, it's all super, super important, right? Let's put a bow on it, land the plane, however we say, boys. But yeah, that, uh, hopefully, um, you know, listeners got in, whether you're a trainer, or coach, listener, client, whatever, got a little bit of something out of today. Um, throw in the comments if you do have any more questions about anything that we did talk about today. But yeah, that's, that's kind of what we wanted to, to mention to the audience was, hey, here's some maybe some fads within the industry about energy levels and all that. We could talk for five hours about this. I think we just blew through an hour, which is nuts to me. But um, do y'all want to close it with anything, Cody, Joseph? Joseph, I'm going to jump the gun. There, there's one thing that I do want to add to, and I want to circle back to starvation mode. And one thing that whenever things pop up in the fitness industry, I always get interested in terms of like, how did this start? Right. And ultimately, I think part of it comes back to, you know, client is not seeing progress and coach is like, oh, shoot, like what's something I can tell them? I hope I'm wrong sometimes. I hope something comes <laughs> out that has proved me wrong for forever. But we are very science based for sure. Research based. We can read a research article. We were all nerds in high school and college. Like we know this stuff. So I always get like you said, I get jazzed up when something comes out. I'm like, maybe they found it. And then I read the article. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. You did it with a population of three people and they didn't even track anything. So what does that do? That's dumb. But I feel like starvation mode, quote unquote, part of it, right? I'm sure it's multifaceted. Part of it was a coach was like, man, I don't, I don't know how to have a hard conversation with this client and let them know that they're under moving. They're not moving as much as they think they are. They're not working out as hard as they think that they are. And they're over consuming what they're reporting or what they're logging and tracking. Right. And so it's easier to say, oh, well, you're not eating enough to lose weight. It's easier to say that than to have that hard conversation about adherence and patience and like, this is an uncomfortable process, not generally physiologically, but like behavior change is not comfortable. And I feel like that is largely why one, one reason why starvation mode came around is it's years to say you need to be eating more to lose weight. And we just know that that's not true. And I think Joseph, you and I talked about this the other day when we were just talking, a lot of people think they're eating 1300 calories, right? Like in truly in their food, they might be, but they are not taking any into account the oil in which they are cooking with, the butter in which they are cooking with, their kids' little snack that they just ate, maybe an alcoholic beverage next to that. Well, sure, you may have ate 1,300 calories of food, but then you ate 800 calories of oil, butter, and an alcoholic beverage. That's usually the main thing us three see when people say they're in starvation mode, when we really start to break down what is going inside their body. Yeah. Last thing, and I know we put a bow on it like an hour ago, but um, when clients mm -hmm. when clients tell me, hey, I'm doing everything perfect, the question I ask back is, if I was next to you all day, what would you change? <laughs> if I followed like, you uh -oh. all day, 
and I was right next to you, what would you do differently? Uh, that's, such exactly. a good, that's such a good question to ask. You told me that yeah. the other day. I was like, I'm going to start using that with my people. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to start my using people, that. Too, my people get ready. I'm going to start speaking <laughs> to you all day long. Well, it's funny because everyone's like, well, I just need someone to follow me around and slap food out of my mouth. Well, we all, I need someone to organize my spreadsheets and respond to clients and all that, but I don't have that. By the way, I'm for hire. If somebody does want a trainer to follow the ground and smack food out of their hand, I'm for <laughs> hire. Throw your zip code out there, Cody. But uh, the uh, rates uh, might be a little... Anyway. Everything is for sale. That's right. Every, there's a price. I You name the price, I'm there. <laughs> I'll sell, right, boys. I'll sell fat burners if the price was right <laughs> all right boys hey it was fun chatting with y'all again episode three we'll figure out the title. i can't remember what the title was but yeah let us know in the comments what you thought maybe some future stuff you want to hear about thanks for coming to the fit chat we will see you later peace out